All right. So you should have gone through some of the example attacks that I provided you on the following um, entry on the on the course website. In this uh, walkthrough, we're going to put together a third attack. Um, so the way this attack is going to work is we're actually going to take advantage of um, the following um, vulnerability, which was released in 2018. So you can see right here is released later on in 2018. Uh, and it targets the uh, WinRAR tool, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, unlike some of the uh, earlier attacks that I demoed, this one will actually use a, um, a m much simpler um, exploit in order to achieve um, the goal of getting a backdoor onto the user system. All right, so without further ado, uh, we will get started. Um, so what I have here is my uh, Windows 7 VM, and I have my um, my Kali VM uh, right here. So this is the same one that I've got. Uh, the most you should have for class. Um, you can see that I've saved it a couple times. Um, anyhow, um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, start it up like so. Um, it should already use, we'll double check the settings here, it should already use the NAT. Um, so we'd like to keep that for right now. We're not going to switch it over to the host adapter yet. Um, and that's mainly because there are some uh, software packages that we want to install. So mainly we want to be able to get the backdoor tool that we're going to use uh, onto this Kali system from the internet. Um, in addition to that, we'll have to install some Python modules as well. So I'm going to start up Kali, and it's going to pop up um, to the restored image, uh, so very similar to um, to where it was set up when uh, when you last saved it. So bring up the terminal emulator here, and I'm just going to double check that uh, that the IP address is set correctly for the NAT. So there it is, um, that 10.IP. Uh, basically indicates that it's getting an IP address off of the uh, internal NAT interface um, that's built into VirtualBox. All right, so um, the first step we're going to do, um, and I'm going to run this in the background really quick um, because it can take a little bit of time. So I'm going to open up a new tab, and you can see the different uh, Kelly tabs here. I did uh, Control-Shift-T in order to create a new tab like that. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to load up the uh, Metasploit console, so MSF console. The reason I'm doing this right now is because MSF console can take a little bit of time to start up. So I'd like it to run in the background um, and get all started up while we're doing other things. So you can see it's already getting started right there. <clears throat> so um, we'll use Metasploit to try to put together the exploit, um, but... Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to build this attack uh, using a um, uh, open source backdoor uh, that's available. Um, it's actually a really good uh, kind of research case study. Um, so even though Metasploit offers its own backdoors, um, we're going to actually show you how to use Metasploit to package a, another backdoor um, so that you can, uh, you know, uh, use any uh, backdoor that you might want. Um, this is a common uh, workflow that some of the adversaries will use as well as Metasploit's backdoors um, being very common um, are also very detectable. So um, I'm going to go here um, and uh, the page that we're going to go to is this one right here. So I'm going to <clears throat> I'm going to just uh, remove the end of this, and we can go look at this person's page. So this um, person created an open source cross-platform uh, remote administration and post-exploitation tool. Um, so they're calling it a RAD. Um, uh, it does fit a lot of the capabilities that I described in the terminology talk earlier. 
as being a rat. Um, the interesting thing about this one is that the interface is primarily command line, um, and then it'll offer web-hosted GUI uh, for some of the features that are, um, you know, uh, much more useful if you have a GUI for them. Um, all the source code is here, so if you're curious how the author of this tool implemented a number of different uh, capabilities, um, all of that's right here at your fingertips. So definitely, if uh, if that interests you, uh, have at it. Uh, what we're going to do first is we're going to go to the installation. So it says uh, refer to the wiki. Um, so I'm going to click right there and close some of these tabs. And the installation that uh, we're going to do is uh, Debian and Ubuntu. Um, now it does say that you can use Docker um, to run this as well. Um, that can actually be really helpful if you're trying to use cloud hosting in order to host the controller for this um, remote access tool. We're just going to go to the Debian uh, Ubuntu setup, and the layout of this is a little bit confusing, so make sure that you read this right here. If you don't want to compile the payloads and instead use pre-built packages, you can skip this part and go directly there. Uh, so uh, this class isn't really about um, all of the in-the-weeds details about how to build your own um, packages and everything like this, so I'm just going to go directly to the instructions on how to get this running as quickly as possible. So rather than using Docker, it's going to use a feature in Python called Virtual Environments, uh, where it'll install all of the dependencies inside of a contained space. Uh, however, the first step that we need to do is we actually need to install some of the system-level packages onto our Kali Linux system. So that's what it tells you right here. Um, I found that if you skip this step and you rely upon um, the uh, pip tool to try and install all of these things, uh, it'll actually fail. Um, because some of these, like this one, um, the lib SSL dev package, it's not uh, available through pip. So make sure that you run this first. Otherwise, you'll see some errors when packages are getting installed uh, that make no sense. Um, so don't skip the uh, the installation step. So I'm going to add these here, <clears throat> and then I'm going to run it. It's going to want me to confirm, right, um, which I'm going to go ahead and do. And now it'll pull down all these files onto my Kali Linux system. <clears throat> I'll make sure that this stuff um, also is available in the uh, course write-up as well, so you can very easily copy-paste as you need. So after I've done that, the next thing I want to do is run this command here, which is a uh, git clone recursive from the repository that I was just looking at. Um, they add the recursive here because this package, this uh, puppy rat package, actually has a number of other GitHub repositories that it refers to. And this will allow it to go and... Tr Traverse the directory tree and pull down all of the dependency pack or dependency repositories as well, um, so that it has everything that it needs. So um, before I run this, um, organization's key. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, create a new directory called attack, and I'm going to cd into it like this, and then I'm going to create a new uh, directory called tools, and then I'm going to cd into tools. And then I'm going to run my git clone. <coughs> and so this way all the tools kind of stay um, collected together in one spot. And you can see it's going through and it's pulling down a whole bunch of the dependency packages that it has, um, or the dependency repositories that it has. <laughs> So once all that's set up, you'll be returned back to the shell, like I am here. And the next thing that we'll want to do is just follow on down the instructions. Um, we like a light installation without the build tool chain. Again, we're not trying to build a bunch of stuff from scratch. Um, we are perfectly happy at this stage just using uh, some of the pre-compiled stuff that the author of this tool actually has posted. 
So I'm going to cd into the puppy folder and here I'll do a ls really quick. So you can see the create workspace Python script is right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this into the dialog box as well. And then I'm going to run it. And this is going to go through and it's going to use uh, pip, the Python package manager, to pull down a whole bunch of Python packages that Puppy Rat uses. Uh, one of the other neat things about Puppy Rat, which is a bit of a departure from some of the other tools that you'll run into, is that it's written in Python, uh, which kind of makes it even more helpful as a uh, learning example, because uh, you get to see um, at, you know, either the Python implementation of some of these features, um, or at the very least how Python will use uh, external libraries and external tools uh, to accomplish some of these things. So you notice a little bit of this um, error about the uh, version of this Flake 8 uh, package. Uh, I found that um, you can safely ignore that, at least for now. Um, so we won't be using or we won't be relying upon that package uh, for some of the stuff that we're going to do today. <coughs> So um, the download time here might take uh, more or less time depending upon your network connection. So just be patient. Just be, you know, recognize that you're pulling down 180 megs uh, worth of stuff. So on a slow link, that could take a little bit of time. And so uh, once we've finished, um, we'll now have a uh, puppy W folder. So this is another thing just to keep in mind uh, with the instructions here, um, the author of this tool accidentally used a different directory name in each one of these different um, command lines, um, but then they refer to the second one, the one that we didn't choose to go with, uh, later on in the instructions. So you just want to make sure that if you see this, puppyws, you want to replace it with puppyw. Uh, and, then, uh, and then everything should work pretty well. So uh, we should be ready to go to the puppy shell now. So I'm going to copy the directory name and go in here. And so you can see it's just a big um, folder of, um, of a tool chain uh, for, the, uh, for the puppy tool. So uh, what I'll do is I'll run bin puppy sh or the puppy shell so we'll do that and you can see that it is uh, initializing a bunch of uh, you know cache credentials and stuff like that um, so that's how you you know that's how the puppy shells run so I'm going to exit this really quick because I don't want to uh, I don't want to jump into building the attack just yet uh, we still want to get a few more components together um, before we're really ready for this tool. So the other thing that we want to do is um, we didn't install WinRAR on the Windows 7 system. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to try and use a, a somewhat creative, it'll be uh, plainly obvious to all of you, um, that we're trying to serve a malicious file. Um, however, um, it'll be kind of for demonstration purposes um, to show you how perhaps you could craft something very quickly um, to, you know, um, uh, convince a user that they're doing something they should be doing, um, you know, legitimate business, uh, when in fact they are um, about to um, install your backdoor. Um, so in order to accomplish this, um, I want to refer back to the exploit. And so in WinRAR versions prior to and including 5.61, there's a path traversal vulnerability. So if I go over here, I will see that to download WinRAR, 5.8 is the latest one. I'm going to copy the link location, and um, we can look at it right here. So 5.80, or I should say 5.80, is at the end of the file name here. Um, let's see what happens 
if I change it to 561, um, one of the, or I should say, the most recent vulnerable version of the tool. And then we'll W get that. So we'll pull that down from uh, WinRAR's site. And we'll find that it's still hosted there. So you'll find that this is a very common practice um, with Adobe, um, with, uh, you know, WinRAR in this case, with WinZip, um, with all sorts of different tools. So that um, they like to keep the old versions hosted on the site. And even though it may not be, you know, directly linked off of this page, it still lives there um, so that it's available for anyone who might need to rely upon linking directly uh, to a specific version of the file. <clears throat> All right. So we've got WinRAR on here. Um, the reason we have we want to pull WinRAR on here is that um, we want to um, we want to pretend to convince the owner of the Windows 7 VM. Um, so pretending that that's a laptop or something running Windows 7, we want to convince them to download um, this particular file. And um, just a fair you know warning, um, this you know as long as you've got this version of WinRAR installed. Um, this exploit should be even achievable on a Windows 10 system. Um, however, uh, Windows 10 with much better security uh, detection mechanisms in place um, is likely to warn you about doing something bad. All right. So we've got Win WinRAR installed. Um, the next thing um, is to double check that we have uh, Metasploit running. <clears throat> so I think we should have everything that we need uh, in order to pull this attack off. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click on this little two-monitor icon here, which is supposed to be representing a network. Um, you can see it's still in the NAT mode. I'm going to click on Network Settings. I want to switch this over to the host-only adapter. Uh, make sure that, say in my case, um, this is VBox Net Zero. Um, on a Linux system. On a Windows system, it'll have a virtual box network adapter or something like that with maybe a number next to it. Um, so for any of you who are using Windows, um, the key thing to keep in mind is that um, if you've used VirtualBox for more than just my class, you're going to want to make sure that you take note of which of the VirtualBox network adapters that you have selected. Um, because you want to make sure that you select the same adapter in both the Windows 7 and in the, uh, you know, and in the Kali setup. So I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to give it a moment to, to wait to update the IP address. And I'm going to run IP adder again. And now I can see that I'm no longer getting the 10 dot. I'm getting that 192.168.56 IP that we saw in uh, last week's classes. So I've confirmed that uh, this thing's connected to the VirtualBox network adapter. So now uh, what I'd like to do <coughs> is um, I'm going to start working on putting together a backdoor. So we'll start with the backdoor. Um, in the puppy rat tool, um, we'll configure it and uh, get it working. We're actually going to use a lot of the defaults. Um, however, I'll show you how to get to the settings if you want to uh, experiment and play with different settings. You'll be able to do that. So we'll go here to uh, puppy <coughs> and then uh, puppy w bin and then puppy sh, right? So now uh, we started the puppy uh, shell again. So the reason I wanted to do this was to make sure that um, this listener here is listening, um, you know, registers itself to the IP address that this system and the Windows system are going to share networks with. So um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do help. Um, and you can see the... Uh, the help screen here. Uh, the other thing that is nice is that um, if you follow the install link, it actually brings you into the GitHub wiki. 
uh, for Puppy Red. So you can see there's a nice table of contents if you scroll up toward the, pop, uh, the top of the page. Um, there's a Get Started section. So the Get Started section shows you what we did. Um, it also goes and explains some of the different transports, some of the different communication mechanisms, the launchers that exist, <clears throat> the listeners, so you know how you can configure it to listen on different ports and stuff like that, the different payload formats. So the payloads are ways that you can package the back door um, to run on a system. So it supports, um, you know, it bundled up in Python, um, PowerShell, um, Rubber Ducky, uh, which is a, a exploiting tool, and then a client. Um, so client is executable to run on the target. So in other words, native binary for whoever the um, intended target is. And this is what we're going to use today, targeting Windows 7 machine with a client payload. So it tells you how to generate the payloads. So here's some examples. So you can make it into a Windows DLL if you want. You can make it into a Windows executable if you want, etc. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run help gen because gen was the name of the command to go and generate stuff, and it'll actually give me some info on how to use it. And it kind of has a very short form of the documentation that you saw over here. And so. Um, one of the important things to keep in mind is that if you look at the Windows 7 VM, um, so, you know, if you uh, were to load it up, uh, you'll notice that it's uh, running a 32-bit version of Windows. So if you want to, you can pause the video and, uh, and double-check that. Um, but that's, you know, I already verified it, so I'm going to move ahead. Um, <clears throat> you want to make sure that the puppy rat that you compile is compiled for the proper version of Windows. However, in this particular case, um, if you run a 32-bit version of the backdoor on a 64-bit Windows, it'll still work. So 32-bit ends up targeting successfully both the 32-bit Windows and 64-bit Windows. Um, but the inverse of that is not true. Um, if you target the 32-bit VM with the 64-bit version of the backdoor, uh, it's not going to work, and you're going to have a bad time. So, um, for this thing, I'm going to first run gen, and then dash capital A for architecture x86. Um, the next option after that is operating system, which is capital O, not to be confused with zero, so target OS. Default is Windows, but we're going to specify it explicitly anyways, right? So, dash capital O, Windows. Um, dash F client. So we said we were going to build the client executable. Um, however, this is worth looking at. Um, one really cool thing here is that this supports targeting Linux systems and Android systems in additional Windows, uh, which is really cool because that means with this one um, backdoor uh, command panel um, or controller, I should say, you're able to control uh, compromised endpoints from all these different platforms, and, you know, with, right from your keyboard, right? Um, and then finally, I'm going to give this uh, output, so dash O, um, the output file, so output file name. So I'm going to call it invoice.exe. So I'm going to pretend that we're responding to someone who asked for an invoice, right? So there's a bunch of other options. You can feel free to... Um, you know, to modify these as you see fit. Um, for instance, uh, output door or output dir uh, d. I'm just going to put dot, uh, so it'll output it to the current working directory. And so you can see that it put it in puppy w. So invoice.exe, right? So now we have a back door that's basically built as a program. Uh, so it's a exe. Uh, like any other uh, EXE program on the system. So now the goal becomes, I want to package this up into a uh, bundle that the uh, the user might want to try and open. And again, we're going to pretend that the, um, you know, 
we're going to pretend we got a naive user here or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so in order to do this, um, in order to basically um, create the RAR file that's going to contain this, we're going to use Metasploit. Um, however, because of the way that Metasploit works, um, I need to um, find out where I'm located. So um, Metasploit kind of works out of the current working directory. Um, so what I want to do is I want to change Metasploit's directory to be this right here, right? And you can use um, the shell commands in Metasploit. So pwd, ls, cd, um, all of those commands work really well uh, in Metasploit, um, just as you would expect them to work on the on the shell. So there we go. Uh, we've moved in here, and you can see the invoice.exe is on the file system. So I do this because uh, when we're building the um, when we're building the RAR bundle, um, for whatever reason, uh, it needs invoice.exe uh, to be in the local working directory um, and not in a subdirectory or some other path. So now um, we're going to use uh, Metasploit to try and find, uh, or I should say, the Metasploit command line um, to try and find our WinRAR exploit. So I'm going to search type exploit WinRAR. So when I do that, you can see that there's two exploits. So there's the name spoofing exploit that's from 2009. And then we have um, this WinRAR ace exploit, which is 2019, so February of last year. Ace format input validation remote code execution. So this matches. Um, this right here. We can also do, uh, I believe we can do this, info that, and you can get a lot more information about it. So you can read through this kind of long form explanation of the, uh, the exploit that they're using to take advantage of this vulnerability and how to configure it. You can see the reference to the CVE, the vulnerability ID number, so that you can verify that it matches the one right here. All right, so um, we found the exploit we want to use, so we use it with the use command um, creatively chosen. <clears throat> so because we're in Metasploit, <clears throat> whoops, <clears throat> Metasploit automatically assumes that you're going to use um, Metasploit's own built-in backdoor. So, um, which is called Meterpreter. So it assumes that you're going to use that. Um, this isn't the case for us. So what we also want to do is change the payload. And uh, to change the payload, first we want to search for another payload. So type payload, so search type payload. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put custom in here um, because Metasploit has a bunch of placeholders for custom payloads. And so there's a whole bunch listed here that probably have the word custom somewhere in their description. Um, but the top header right here is this one that's just called custom payload. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this as the payload. That way Metasploit doesn't try to configure any of the uh, meterpreter features. So I'm going to do set payload, and uh, the thing that you'll need to keep in mind is that while I did a use um, exploit slash windows slash file format slash winrar underscore ace, um, in order to set the payload, I actually have to take the payload um, path component off of this description. So I'm going to do set payload generic slash custom. So scroll back down, and there we go. So now if I run options again, um, it may have gone a little bit too fast, um, but um, the payload is now populated with generic-custom uh, with a handful of things here. And it says that these two aren't required. So we're not going to use um, the generic-custom payload uh, variables here um, because this module actually comes... Prepackaged with its own variable. 
Um, mainly the reason we wanted to change the payload here was just to tell Metasploit um, that we aren't planning on configuring Meterpreter, so not to give us errors when we choose not to configure Meterpreter. So we, in this case, for this module, we have to be very specific uh, with what we intend to do. All right, so now, if you remember, invoice.exe right here is our, um, you know, is our backdoor. So I'm going to do set cust file. This syntax works very similarly to how we set the payload earlier. So I'm going to do that, and it shows the change that was made right here. And then if I go up here, you can see it's reflected up here in the, uh, in the options summary. And then also, I'd like to change the output file name to be something that is a little bit more um, specific, right? Or I should say a little bit more attractive to the user than msf.ace. So I'm going to set file name as invoice.pdf.ace. <clears throat> the reason I'm going to do this is that a uh, real common uh, feature of Windows um, where typically it's installed this way by default is that if the file extension is known to one or more applications, it'll actually hide it from the user. Um, so in the user's explorer window, the user may just see something called invoice.pdf, which would be something they would feel safer clicking on, um, especially if it's called invoice.pdf because um, that looks like an invoice. That looks like something that needs my action. So I'm going to set the file name to that as well. We run options just to verify that we have everything the way we want it, and we do. So finally, I'm going to use the exploit command. And the exploit command is going to create the custom payload and then set it in here. So depending upon the different modules, um, exploit might, um, you know, host a, um, <clears throat> it might um, start a, a, a shell listener. So it might start a backdoor listener on the system. Um, for instance, if we had had um, interpreter uh, still set as the payload, it might have started a, um, a, a interpreter listener, uh, which we didn't really want it to do. It'd be kind of a waste of resources. Um, exploit might um, start attacking a system that you set as the target. Uh, for some of the uh, modules that are um, that are supposed to actively target a uh, a vulnerability. Um, so, for instance, if you have vulnerability in a particular web application or something like that, exploit might start launching attacks at the system, um, you know, that that you gave it. So, but in this case, all it did was it created a file, and then it expects us to somehow get that file over to the user, or I should say, over to the victim. <clears throat> so, I'm going to leave uh, Metasploit running just so this is there. Um, but you can see that Metasploit stores this in a local folder. Um, that's part of the Metasploit framework standard path. Um, I don't really want it to stay there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up another shell. And I would really like this to go and live in the uh, puppy rat um, folder as well. So let's see. Um, I put that inside of attack, right? Tools, and then puppy, right? and then puppy w. So I'm going to copy this into here. And then finally, um, I'd also like to grab this file, the WinRAR executable, and put it in the same spot. So I'm going to do this. And now we got all three of them here, right? And so finally, um, the last thing we want to do is we want to wrap these, wrap all these things up into a, um, you know, into a nice, uh, helpful bundle. Um, so not to make this uh, too time consuming, or in order to not make this too time consuming, I actually put together this little HTML file uh, ahead of time. So. 
I'm actually going to just do this cat puppy.html. So I'm going to grab this stuff, this content, and then I'm going to <clears throat> create an index.html right here. I'm going to paste this in. And now index.html contains um, that content. So the goal here is that um, <clears throat> we would want to get the user to visit this, um, maybe by sending them a short email that says, um, your invoice is available, please click here. And then this ends up being hosted on a, um, you know, maybe an AWS server that has a domain name that looks very similar to, say, a, you know, service that the user is using or something like that, right? Um, you know, or maybe a service been compromised. Those are all, um, you know, possible ways that the adversary might attack. So we'll pretend that one of those things happened here, um, and that this web page, um, or I should say, a link to this web page, uh, got set. <coughs> excuse me, got sent over to the user somehow. So uh, the important thing here is you can notice that. Um, WRAR561 is linked in here, um, and then invoice.pdf.ace is also linked in here. So a, um, a tool that I like to use um, that's very simple for things like this is called um, Python Simple HTTP Server. So if I run Python -m, uh, simple simple HTTP Server, and then I'm going to give it port 80. Uh, I'm not running a web server on this computer, on this VM, I mean. Um, so I'm going to run this at port 80. And so now it's going to listen on port 80. So it's going to look a little bit more like a, uh, you know, a regular web server. Um, so, but you can get as creative as you want with this, um, example. Uh, if it, you know, if, if that, uh, helps you, uh, learn this stuff better, uh, by all means, go ahead. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load up the um, the Windows 7 VM. So this is it right here. Um, one of the things I'm going to do, um, just because it's a little bit obnoxious, I'm going to turn the audio off. Um, it also wastes cycles. So if Windows doesn't see that there's a uh, audio card, Windows won't try running uh, any of the audio code at all. But if there is a sound card that's present, then Windows will use a lot of the you know, uh, resource intensive, um, features to try and play sounds and everything. So if you turn that off, um, you know, long story short, uh, you'll eke a little bit of performance out of your VM. Additionally, you can see that I had set this as untouched, so I've changed the state, uh, so just, you know, keep that in mind. <clears throat> if you revert this VM, then the VM is going to, I'm going to start Windows normally. I must have uh, shut it down ungracefully last time. Uh, so if you run into that, um, that happens too. Um, from time to time, just start Windows normally. Um, it'll fix anything on the drive that it needs to fix. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, we'll start up Windows. Um, there's one more important thing I forgot to do. Um, so I'm going to do it right quick, which is I forgot to set this to the host only adapter. So I'm going to do that now. And we'll let Windows boot up. And you can see the network adapter is connecting. Um, so one thing you may want to do is just make sure that when you have the settings window up, if you decide to turn off the sound card, uh, make sure you also change the network to uh, host-based uh, networking. Uh, we do not need access to the internet uh, for this session of the Windows 7 VM. Uh, the other thing you may run into, especially as the course goes on and new versions of VirtualBox are released by Oracle, um, you'll see that the guest editions that are installed inside this VM uh, start to become out of date. Uh, update them at your leisure. Um, as long as you don't stay too far behind, they're typically pretty compatible. So I'm just going to close that. I don't want to waste time right now uh, trying to update them in front of everyone. 
So next what I'm going to do is I'm just going to double check um, and um, first bring up a, whoops, first bring up PowerShell um, just as a simple command line. Um, I'm going to double check that the IP address on here uh, got set to what I want it to be, slash all. <clears throat> and you can see right here, so we're on the same network as the uh, puppy rat listener, right? So let me load up Internet Explorer. Um, this thing's going to go and try to try to go to Bing. Uh, we don't ever want to go to Bing, so um, I'm just going to cancel that. Uh, HTTP colon slash slash 192.168.56.104. So we're going to just go directly to the IP address that's over here. Um, if you have forgotten it, you can always run IP adder, and it'll be right here next to its net mask. So I'm going to go to that. And so now you can see that the HTML file that I was, um, that I put together, uh, is here. And it looks like a really short message trying to tell you that, you know, here's the invoice you requested. Uh, so if, um, you know, if your target typically deals with invoices, this might not be, you know, too eyebrow raising to them. So please use this tool to view it and get back to us. Um, it's not uncommon. Uh, for people dealing with a lot of like payment systems and stuff like that, uh, to have to install a tool uh, in order to view an invoice that was generated um, by uh, some sort of um, you know some sort of like invoice uh, inventory management software or purchasing software or something like that. So I'm going to follow the instructions. First, install the tool. Um, I'm going to run it. Um, <clears throat> so. This um, system isn't connected to the internet, so it's going to run the security scan here. Um, but it's unable to get to the internet, so it's going to say, you know, it couldn't be verified. If this both had access to the internet and also had access to, um, you know, had access to the system that's hosting this, right? Um, so if that 192.168 was actually a public IP or a public domain that was hosting this, um, you wouldn't necessarily see this dialog box here um, because it would be able to verify that that is a um, legitimate you know, vendor tool and it's the proper version and everything it hasn't been tampered with. So I'm going to run it. Um, you know, I'm going to install it. Um, I'm just going to go with the defaults here. And then I'm going to click Done. So now... It's all installed, and it pops this up, so I'm like, okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. <clears throat> and that has been dropped into my downloads folder, right? So invoice.pdf. So remember what I said? Um, the .ace file name got chopped off, so this looks like a PDF. And the other neat thing is that um, we could even go so far as to get like a PDF icon for it and stuff like that. So um, putting more effort into this attack, uh, we could basically make it more believable. We're kind of going with a, um, you know, with kind of like a baseline right here um, that any sort of creativity can be added to to make this more believable. So I'm going to do what's common, which is just extract here. And um you know, that's, you know, interesting. I don't know why um, it didn't show up. But, okay. So maybe I'll go and respond to the person who sent, who I think sent this to me and tell them that the, you know, please resend, um, no invoice opened up. So <clears throat> the other thing that you'll notice is if you bring your puppy rat console over here, oops, um, oops, Sorry. If you bring up your puppy rat console over here, um, nothing's really happened so far. Um, so stepping out of the user's um, point of view for a moment and stepping into the adversary's point of view, uh, what happened is that that path traversal um, exploit allows something to be extracted and then dropped into an arbitrary location. So in this case, it wrote it into the startup folder uh, in the Windows uh, start menu. 
So here it is, invoice. And if I wanted, if I wanted to, I could go to properties and I could see that it's in this folder. You can see details, um, security, compatibility, etc. right? So invoice, it's an exe. So it's the invoice exe that we packaged inside of the RAR archive earlier. So, um, you know, normally, you know, if you're a user, um, you, you would not have seen any of this happen. The desktop hasn't changed or anything like that. Um, so you might reboot the system, or you might end up being told to reboot the system because of Windows Update or something like that. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to simulate, say, restarting the system due to update or due to running out of battery power or uh, something like that, right? Uh, either, anyway, the system is going to shut down, um, or even the user is going to log out. So you can think of a um, a desktop um, that's at the office. Um, the user logs into and out of during the day. Um, so this reboot cycle that I'm doing now, um, even just logging out and logging back in would simulate this too um, because it's in the startup folder in the start menu. Um, that's a list of applications that are actually run at uh, login time not necessarily at system boot time. So we're going to let this come back up. Um, it might take uh, a little bit um, for this to uh, to start up. <clears throat> and again, uh, remember, uh, for everyone here in class, this attack is, um, is fairly straightforward. So um, the purpose of this class isn't necessarily to um, to teach you how to create the most stealthy exploits um, and, you know, run the most stealthy attacks. The purpose of this class is primarily to analyze malware. And starting with a very uh, simple contrived example is a very easy way, um, is a very good spot to start. So um, if you were looking at your puppy rat terminal, you might have noticed this happened, um, which is telling you that <coughs> this IP address connected from this port uh, to this IP address on this port, which is the listener for your puppy rat, right? <clears throat> so puppy rat has a number of built-in commands. Uh, we can go and look at them again. Um, so a good one is get info. Also, there's PS. Um, there's interactive shell. So, for instance, I could run info for get info. Uh, so if I run get info, it shows me for the connection um, or connections, if I have multiple connections, it shows me what host name, uh, the username of the logged in user that I'm masquerading as, um, where the back door is installed and running from. So you can see it's running out of the startup folder. It tells you the process ID, um, tells you the IP address, the MAC address, um, gives a unique um, ID for the node, which looks like it's based on the MAC address. Um, the launcher arguments, so we can change launcher behavior by giving it different arguments and gives you the platform. So you can, you know, filter down, um, to the different platforms. <clears throat> we'll go back to help. Um, I can do interactive shell, right? So I can run shell. See this right here. And so what do we think that's going to do? Now look here. It gives you command.exe. So you're on dir, right? So you're on CD to tell me where I'm at, or you can look at the you know path here. You can do CD uh, users dir. I can see IE user is in here. So the you know so all of this is in here, right? I can go into the documents if I wanted to. I can pull down the documents. Um, oops, sorry, I got a Unixism in there. Um, so like. All this stuff is in there, and then I can exit, and it will return me back to Puppy Rat. I can also do PS, and it will give me a list of all the um, programs that are running on the system right now, which is also really helpful. And so I have all sorts of, um, you know, all sorts of uh, fun things that I can do. So the other thing is that um, this gives you kind of some of the base commands and then some of the alias modules or basically some of the modules that are connected to aliases. 
Um, I can also run help-m to get more verbose help um, on all the modules, not just the um, not just the core um, functionality. And this is really nice because I can get, for instance, um, you know, remote desktop hosted in a web browser if I wanted to. Um, I could use WMI to run queries and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I could create a interactive SSH shell if I wanted. Um, I don't know if that works in Windows or not. Um, I haven't tried it, um, but feel free to try it if you want. Enable, disable RDP connection. Um, so you can do all sorts of stuff like that. Um, let's see, what else does it have in here? This one's a neat uh, remote file system, so mount remote file system as a FUSEFS to mount point here uh, on the local system. Um, I can zip or unzip a file or directory, so I can zip up a directory and then download it, um, which is like a kind of like a handy exfiltration technique. Um, I can open an interactive Python shell on the remote client, so if I wanted to run inside of the Python interpreter that's running on the Windows system, I can do that, and I can execute commands in it as if I were, you know, running Python in there, um, which can be helpful because Python's super powerful, so if I have Python code, I can run it in there. Um, so there's a number of things in here that are really, uh, they're really, really useful. So there's a <clears throat> loot memory, crawl process memory, and look for clear text credentials. I can do a credential dump. So maybe what I want to do is I want to log in here and uh, maybe want to do this, right? So I can do dash H to see that. So it says download the hives from your window system and dump creds. So it's going to try and pull down the different um, registry hives. So the sections in the registry um, that are part of the system. It's going to pull them all down, download them to the local system. For me. So this is also a really handy, once you get access to the system, pull these down really quickly. Um, for any of you who are doing, um, you know, um, CTF challenges, stuff like that, these types of things will be very helpful for that. So once it's done, it pulls out um, the hashes that are available, um, prepared in a format uh, that can be used uh, for some of the uh, password crackers, if you wish. So if you want to, you can even uh, run these in something like Hashcat or something like that. Um, make sure you, you know, read the documentation on how to crack like LMNT hashes. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you can, um, you know, you can go and do that and you can try and make sure it gets the right password. Um, I'm going to run the help dash modules again. Um, one of the other um, things to do as well um, would be to look at the uh, privilege escalation modules that are here. Um, so a common one to do is git system, which is try to get NT authority system privileges. So I'm going to run, um, I'm going to run the sessions, right? Um, so sessions shows me um, the sessions that are currently connected. So you can see the address integrity level. So that's kind of like authority level. Um, shows you the platform release, host name, and then the user. So I'm going to run this git system. And what git system is going to do is it's going to, um, it's going to use a number of exploits to try and get, um, oops, I actually ha have to do uh, one of these two. So I'm going to grab the first one and person name. It's going to use uh, some well-known techniques for trying to get system level administration privileges on a system. So even though I'm local admin, a local administrator, so the IE user account has administrative privileges, it doesn't have the highest level of privilege on the system. Uh, in order to do some real crafty things like install rootkits and stuff like that, I want to get um, higher level privileges. Um, so that's what I did here. And you can see that what happened is um, it uh, says it injected a DLL into target process 3900. So if I wanted to, I could run PS, and I could see 
that's this right here. So, um, you know, cmd.exe, um, you know, is where it injected into. Also, I can run sessions again. And now I can see that I have two sessions available. So what happened is that it injected that. Um, it didn't replace the current session, the unprivileged session running under IE user. It actually created a new session. So um, if I run sessions dash dash h, it'll actually give me some help for sessions. This gives me the ability to pick and choose whether I want to kill this session or not. Um, one other thing to keep in mind when using Puppy Rat is uh, that by default it'll send a command to all connected um, systems. Um, so in this case, I sent the info command and it sent it to both of the sessions. Uh, which that can be really, that can be useful sometimes, but maybe I just want to run, oh, whoops, I just want to run it on one of them. And so the way I would do that is I would do sessions dash i and I would tell it which one I want to run it on. And then it would only run it on one of them. If I decided that I wanted to go and run it on all of them again, I might do this. Um, or if I wanted to run it on two very specific ones, I would do this. So star, just like in your normal file name globbing, uh, is going to be shortcut for all of them. And then um, you can comma separate um, the sessions if you only want to run it on two of them, including like non-consecutive ones. Um, so that's basically how we got a very simple backdoor installed on the system and even attempted to simulate a little bit of uh, social engineering uh, that might have uh, been used in getting the malware to the in the hands of the user. Um, of course, it was a very obvious technique here, but also, um, you know, we're only doing this operation you know, very quickly uh, in the video. So feel free to elaborate um, beyond for um, for your own experimentation purposes. Thank you very much.